Hello and welcome to Gardener's World. Interesting, isn't it? How gardens constantly changing. The other morning I came down, I was making a cup of tea and I peeked out the window and I could see these gorgeous white paper-like flowers of the Astrantia. The cuts well for the house actually. And all this old growth was tied in it and I would normally leave that for winter interest, but I'm gonna cut it back. Get another four, six weeks out of these and then I'll leave these for the winter months. Coming up on today's programme. Francis heads to the beach to look at plants that may be the most adaptable for our gardens. The key thing that this plant does to protect itself from the wind and the drought is it has incredibly furry leaves. They stop moisture loss. It's a really important thing for a plant that can get moisture to hold onto it. We meet a gardener who revels in the magic of a garden filled with wildlife. So I uh, got to feed our little Robin. He uh, come down for his brunch. We spend the day with a man who is determined to restore his local orchards. When we came here, it was full of scrub and we started to do some pruning to help the apple trees survive and so they don't fall over. And we're starting to make a difference. And I will be planting a tree and adding some autumn interest to my gravel garden. You might remember last time you were here, we were lifting that turf up and I said I wanted to create a little seating area tucked back in here. When it comes to laying paving, I think maybe there's a bit of a fear factor with it. Yeah, it's a bit physical, but it's not that difficult. So here, what I've done is I've marked out an area that's two metres by two metres. Then you've got to dig out. Most important thing is the foundations. It's the surface that you're going to build on. So I've dug out to a depth of 200 mils. That allows me to put just over 100 mil of hardcore. Here, I've got crushed concrete and I've just topped that off with a little bit of sharp sand. And then I've really compacted it. Simply walk over it, tread it down, a little bit of water on it, and then even ramming it like that with a block of timber we'll settle it down after that you allow for the depth of the bed which is what we lay our paving slabs on and that's 40 mil and then you allow for the depth of the paving slab so i've got two more to get down so we best get on for that bed what i use is six parts sharp sand and one part cement so i've started mixing this already i mixed it partly in the barrow dry to make sure that everything was combined. And then just add water. Make sure it's really well mixed up. So, we're good. It might look like a lot of sand and cement, but what you don't want is your paving slabs moving. What I'm gonna do is just take it away from the edging stones a little bit. And then what that does is the paving slab goes down. It means that the mortar underneath can push into that space. Let's get the first one in place. You'll see I've got a little line there to work to. So now, Spirit level on. This falls that way over the whole thing. The fall is probably about two centimetres. So imagine you don't want any water sitting on it. Tamp this down. What you're doing now is working your way around the pavement slab. Keep your hand on it because you can actually feel the slab going down. And I'm working to the line. Let's check level wise. That's it. So, I've got another one to get in here. While I'm doing that, we're now off to catch up with Francis, who seems to be having a lovely time 
on a beach in East Sussex. Despite the salty air, wind, storms, all the elements, you can find beauty and colour on our shorelines. Without any nurturing, these plants survive despite the harsh environment. Look, there's sea kale, docks, thistles, and all sorts of plants that have adapted to endure adversity. With a changing climate, our weather is becoming increasingly unpredictable. And maybe we could all learn a thing or two from nature and plant things that will thrive in that changing environment. And for many of us, that means hotter, harsher, and drier conditions. The plants here have evolved and adapted to the conditions and have particular features that identify their tolerance. This is sea kale or cranberry maritima and you can see it all over this beach. It's one of the most well adapted species to survive here in coastal shingle. There are a number of things that it does in order to do that. The first thing you notice is this really chunky, tough, silver leaf. Now it's covered in a kind of waxy cuticle that protects it from bright sun and from very drying winds. But after a storm, when the shingle's washed away, you can see incredibly long roots, metres and metres, that allow it to access fresh water down below at the water table. On this one, you can also see this ex-flower head, which is now a seed head. And these lovely little pea-like seeds are very, very strong and they'll float around on the sea, wash up on another beach somewhere where they can germinate and grow. So all these different things to enable it to survive where, as you can see, little else will. They also taste good. <laughs> there are plants all along our shorelines that are commonplace in our gardens. This rather magnificent plant is a Vabascum thapsus and it's a biennial. So the first year you probably wouldn't even notice, look, there's one here, a low growing one that's adapted to be low, protected from the wind and then in its second season it throws up this amazing flower spike covered in yellow flowers which attract all kinds of pollinators. There's flies and ants on here as well. It makes a striking addition to any garden and can survive in the most exposed locations. The key thing that this plant does to protect itself from the wind and the drought and the salt here is it has incredibly furry leaves. Now these make it strong against wind but also they stop moisture loss. It's a really important thing for a plant that can get moisture to hold onto it. Like the sea kale, the verbascum also has a long taproot that can access moisture and nutrients deep in the ground. So it can thrive in even the poorest soils. It's perfect for a gravel garden. And there is another garden favourite here, demonstrating exactly why it's so suitable for dry, arid spaces. This is a sedum and it's really low growing. You can see it sort of scrambles along the surface of the rocks here and especially thrives where there's just a little bit of shelter from the wind. Now this low foliage, which is evergreen, is going to be there all year round and because it is so, so close to the ground, that is specifically for protection from that salty wind. But then, in the summer, it throws up tall spikes of flowers so pollinators can see them from all over the place come and pollinate these plants. There are many sedums which work well in our gardens. The taller varieties in shades of pink are a magnet for bees. And the lower growing ones like these make great ground cover and will survive any drought. The reason for this is that they have evolved succulents these succulent leaves that can store and hold onto water just to let them cope with drought, which they will definitely get here. Not all the plants that thrive on the coast would be suitable for our gardens, but we can definitely find lots of inspiration for some climate-proof planting from our next trip to the beach.
That was a rather nice walk along the beach, wasn't it? Francis will be back later on to explain to us how that idea of right plant, right place, plant communities in the wild can influence the way that we garden. I'm just tapping in this last paving slab. So I put in that main block and then I've put like a frame around. What that does, well, apart from just make it look good, is it gives a link to the little path over there. And now all I've got to do is haunch this in. And what I mean by that is you just want the sort of more vertical side of your paving to be held into place. So that ultimately, if you stood on the edge there, it's not going to move away. And we'll give that a really good clean down, leave it a couple of days, and then I'm going to dry point it. So what I mean by that is I'm going to do a mix of soft sand and cement, four to one, so four parts sand, one part cement, and I'll brush it between the joints, and then I'm just going to work it in with the trowel like that, give it a wash down, and then it'll be ready for a couple of chairs, and watch that sun go down. And interestingly, straight away, I'm looking, and because it's a light colour, the light's bouncing, and you can see it dancing on that pruna cerula. The bark's incredible. And actually, I've put in a cornice controversa here, Beautiful layered tree, good early flower, grows to about three and a half metres, got a berry, but then wonderful red stems. But also it's dividing this tucked away seating area with the little dining area down there. So that's already feeling good. Now we're off to Hampshire for one of your films to meet sisters Isa and Eliza. Hello, my name is Isa. I'm nine years old and welcome to our garden. What is special about this pond is that it's got some recycled materials like these old bricks here and a window from our old playhouse. Also, when there's a bug hotel inside it. We completed making the pond earlier this year and now we are starting to see some lily pads and some small animals inside. Here is another recycled part of our garden because it is, is using an over a hundred year old fireplace. Inside we've tried to make it look like there's a fire lit inside is by putting these dark leaf orangey red begonias. And down here this used to be the yeah, a fiery plant which had which has rosemary leaves which you can see now but when it's in flower it looks like mini flames. On my ninth birthday I got this lemon tree which I wanted for now two years and now I finally have one. And because of this heat weather it's doing quite nicely with this one here and then a lot more of them are up here some small new growth for next year's fruit. This is my mummy and I always help her in the garden. I couldn't have, have had such a nice space without her. Oh. We hope you enjoyed looking around our garden. Bye. Hi, Isa. I thought the way those begonias came out of that fireplace looked incredible. And guess what? You and I have got something in common. Every single birthday, I say, please can I have? And it is always something for the garden. And this year, it was this cornice. As the weather starts to break and there's a little bit moisture in the ground, and the mornings are cooler. It's a great time of year just to start to think about the structural planting, things like the shrubs and the trees. Trees are really important on lots of levels, you know, habitat, breaking up space. But here, tree planting I've done already is creating a rhythm through the garden. And what it does is it pulls the trees that are out of the garden into the space. I think now this is starting to feel all right. But I've got one more I want to get in. 
when it comes to planting a tree, don't laugh, and I know it sounds obvious, but the first thing you've got to do is dig a hole. But this hole is rather important. And that last little bit that I'm taking out is a subsoil. So I'm putting it to one side. I'm not keeping it. So what I do is dig a hole. There's twice the width of the pot that I'm working with. But you want a square hole because ultimately once the roots get in and they work their way out, they'll get to a corner and they'll establish themselves. Whereas actually if you've got a round hole, especially in clay soils, the roots will just go round and round and your tree sits there, doesn't really get its feet into the ground and doesn't grow that well. Depth wise, what I do is measure there, lay a spade across. So the top of the compost that it's in it's going to sit just very slightly above the ground and that's exactly what I want because I've loosened up the bottom of the hole it will settle a little bit and on top of that the roots will pull it into the ground. So this is a Euonymus europaeus and it's a spindle tree so you've probably seen it in hedgerows and I think it's a really underrated tree. It grows to about three meters, incredible autumn color. Flowers lovely and it's got a slightly odd fruit that I like. Pink with an orange center and the birds love it. And it provides super dapple shade. So for here, I think it'll work really well. So let's knock this thing out now. See what it's like root wise. Now look at all that white fibrous root. That is fantastic. I might just tease it a little bit underneath there. Right, now let's get that back in. There we go, beautiful. Once your tree's in, you can just start working the soil back around your tree. I've put no goodness in whatsoever. I've got plenty of goodness in the topsoil. And actually, I want this tree to work a bit. I want the roots to get out into the ground. And you can see the soil that I'm putting in is, is, is quite fine. You know, if it was claggy and lots of big lumps, I would actually start to break it up because you don't want lots of sort of air pockets. Then you don't want the roots growing into sort of open space or water could sit in areas. So this is not going to need staking because it's a little multi-stem, small tree. It's interesting, you know, when it comes to tree planting. I've definitely gone back to a place where getting them in in the autumn is so much better for them. Because if you think about it, the last, what, four of the five springs have been incredibly dry. Whereas this time of year, there's still some warmth in that soil. The roots will grow. It means by next spring, that tree's going to be in a pretty good place. Now, we're off to Bristol to meet a fellow called Mark Glanville. And he gardens very much with wildlife in mind. I think you need wildlife in a garden as much as you need the plants because the two go together. If you've just got plants, yes, that's great, but you, you need to create the, the living environment. You need to create that habitat where everything is working together in harmony. Sorry, we've uh, got to feed our little Robin. He uh, come down for his brunch. I've always loved wildlife, but I've, I've got a soft spot for birds in particular. There's three things uh, I think you need if you want to bring wildlife into your garden. Water, the hedge, and trees. And so if anybody's interested in attracting wildlife to your garden, those three things set you on the right path. The palm was my first project. You need some oxygenating weed in there, a lily is good, and a few uh, marginal plants around the edges. Then wildlife will come, I don't know where it comes from, but wildlife will make its way to your pond. 
in the rockery around the edge is salvias and sages. And then the other side, I've got lots of little troughs with origin and verbena, and there's big pots of agapanthus. So they're designed to be out in flower to attract bees and hoverflies, places for the dragonflies and damselflies that land on. So I'm trying to create some place where insects and frogs and toads, you know, it's comfortable for them to live. And the beauty of having the pond is that it creates um, a place for midges and gnats and all that, which when they go up in the evening, I've got a ready-made food supply for the swift, so th th right on their doorstep. So it helps, it helps everything. It took me five years of box building and about 20 boxes, and I finally crack the design, the swift box design, and in 2010 I got my first pair of swifts in one of my boxes. And they almost become like an extended part of the family, and you look forward to them, and you worry about them, and, and when they come back, they're so happy and joyful, they kind of bring the, the sky alive. They, it's almost like the sky becomes electric. When I'm sat in that garden, for all intents and purposes, I'm sat in the middle of the countryside. I've planted the trees in such a way that it creates a green envelope all the way around the house, so it makes me feel that I'm out in the country, and yet I'm just in the middle of the city. I love trees. One of my first jobs, I was a forester for a few years, and I've got a soft spot for trees, uh, and I like shapes of trees. This is a wonderful tree here, so Cantoni Aster, really it's a large shrub, but I'm, I'm trying to create it into a, a tree shape. It really wants to go upright, so I've got wires and strings on it, and I'm bending the branches down. I'm hoping they're going to harden into the shape I've got it, so hoping by the autumn it's going to keep that shape. It's just finished in flowering now. It was covered in white flowers, and that was covered in bees and butterflies. When that's finished, in the autumn, that's a mass of red berries, and it's wonderful for thrushes and blackbirds. And last year, it was full of field fare and um, red wings. So if you've got space in your garden, always worth putting one of those in. When you design a garden, I think all, all plants, you earn their right to be in there. They've got to, A, look good to me, and B, be good to the insects. So if it, if it ticks those two boxes, it, it gets a place in the garden. Uh, and, and I think the, the key to creating a good wildlife balance is having a continuity of flowering plants and succession. We want that food source rolling on throughout the year and into the winter as well. This is an absolute cracking little plant. It's uh, Viper's Bougloss. Flowers like crazy for a couple of months in the summer. Beautiful blue with pink buds. Bees, honeybees, bumblebees, absolutely love it. And I always got to find a little place for this. And it self seeds like crazy. And then just across there, I've got Bowles Mauve, which is the everlasting wallflower. That's one of my super plants. Flowers down there 10 months of the year. Always there for anything to have a quick feed on. So that's always in the background. But this is the star of the show at the moment. For a couple of months, this is a real beauty. The colour palette in the garden is down to Jane. Um, as you can see, the garden is, is, is blues and purples and reds and whites. Jane takes photographs of the garden. She's head of colour control and design. I'm not allowed orange in the garden. I, I do like a bit of orange and a little bit of yellow, but uh, I, I do sneak a bit in occasionally. But normally it doesn't last long. My latest project is the lawn. Now, I, to be fair, I was always a bit precious about my lawn. You know, I was into wildlife, but the lawn was the lawn, and the lawn had to be weed-free and green. And, but, you know, this is a wonderful place for wildlife, you know, and we're, we're not using it, and let it go. So I bought 10 grams of white clover, red clover, bird's foot trefoil, and um, self-hill, and I scarified the whole lawn, and now it's, it's come up, and it probably won't flower this year, but I'm really, really excited that 
this huge area, which is basically a, a green desert now, will be a really good place for insects in the future. It's a work in progress, so you have to come back and see what it looks like in a year's time. I love being out in the garden and um, uh, people say to me, you know, isn't it hard work, isn't it a bit of a chore? And it's never a chore. It's very important to have a place you can sit and just relax. So when I've done the gardening, that's my rest time. I can sit there, look at the garden, look at the Swiss and just chill out. Looking at my lawn, I think I'm going to take the same approach as Mark and give up on it. Start to introduce some wildflower over the autumn and have that same experiment going on next year. The tree, already get the sense that it's going to work. Look, you can already see the dapple shade. So imagine in time it gets to three metres, that's going to be a really comfortable space to sit in. But it's going to block off that window, but that's good because I can put a bird feeder here, great little view. And actually the moment I move across out of that other window, you can see the view down to the new seating area. It will frame it beautifully. Amazing, isn't it? Just what one tree can do. Add height, interest, divide space, frame a view. Great for wildlife. Brilliant. Still to come. We visit a Gloucestershire orchard where people are pitching in to preserve both the trees and fruit. We get up to 20 or so volunteers here uh, once a month on a, on a Saturday and a great opportunity for me to be able to talk to people about the things that I love about traditional orchards and share those skills. And Francis visits a garden that is experimenting with drought tolerant plants. Have you seen a big change here over the years? We're noticing some plants that have been here for a long time are suffering. As that happens, we're taking those plants out and replacing them with plants that we know are going to work. But first, we have one of your films, and we're off to the southwest to meet Michael Anderson, who has a neat way of watering his plants. Hello Gardener's World, I hope you're all keeping well. I just wanted to show this really useful idea with you all today on how to keep your soil hydrated for longer. So in this bed here, I want to plant some tomatoes, but the trouble is the soil dries up so quickly and I don't always have time to water. So my plan is using oyas what it basically is, is an unglazed terracotta pot. And what you do is you bury it so that the top is just showing. And then you fill it with water. And because it's made of terracotta, terracotta is porous. So the water seeps out of the terracotta and into the soil. And any plants nearby will get attracted to the moisture and grow towards the oil and then they'll take moisture from the oil as and when they need it. And because it's buried deep underground, the water doesn't evaporate as quickly, so you end up using less water than traditional surface watering. Now, you could buy an oil like this, but they're quite expensive, so I'm going to show you a cheaper option using a terracotta pot, a saucer, and some sand and cement. But before we do that, I'm going to show you one that I've made earlier. If you notice the soil around the outside, it's all really damp. And I haven't actually watered this area for a couple of days. So you can see that the oil is doing its job. 
So what you want to do next is place your pot in a bucket of water and what this does is it makes the concrete adhere better to the terracotta and you want them to be about an inch thick or 25 mil and then I pat them down with my hand to sort of compact them and then you leave them for 24 hours and then you'll just want to fill in the soil around it and get rid of any air pockets and you're ready to go so then you just fill it up with water and stick the lid on it and that stops evaporation and bugs fall in it so now I can plant my tomatoes fairly nearby and I will give them a normal water because they're small but then the oil should take over I love learning new ideas and hints and tips in gardening and I hope this idea has been useful for you. Bye. Michael, I do think you will have quite a lot of people following suit next summer. Brilliant, mate. I'm in my gravel garden, so actually, I don't want to use water in here at all. And I'm starting to add a few more plants that deal with those drier conditions. And look at that. It's called Autumn Snowflake. And this is a plant that grows in Spain, parts of Portugal, on a mountainside, rocky conditions. Tiny little bulbous plant, dormant for an awful lot of the year, eventually grows to about 20 centimetres. And then this time of year, Going well into the autumn months, you get this tiny little snowflakey flower. That little beauty will seed around, disappear for a large part of the year, and then pop back up. And this time next year, just stop you in your tracks. You might remember last time you were here, I was planting this side of the garden and I wasn't quite sure what to put this side as the structural plant. Well, I've gone for a euphorbia, which is known as the honey spurge. It'll get to about 1.5, possibly nearly two metres, quite light and feathery, but great foliage. Put grasses against it, it looks superb. And then the other planting around, it's quite hardy. So I've gone for a rosemary, flomus, grasses and then my little gamble. I did say in here I was going to take gamble so I put some ginger in and I will mulch that and leave for the winter and see how it gets on. Now if I come back to this side the second one that I want to add is slightly unusual. It's known as the Goldilocks Aster and can be found in parts of this country growing wild. Loves limestone cliffs so we'll deal with dry conditions. Grows to probably a couple of foot, but I think the flower is gorgeous. And I was gonna put it in with the nephophias here because you get this lovely movement off it. So if I now come and put that in, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Bear with me, you probably, what's he on about? Oh boy's crackers. Right. Look at that. And if I just do that, look at that. But I think it works within the fofia because it's not just the flower shapes are different, but look at the difference in the foliage. And this is quite strong, vertical. This is quite light and feathery. Beautiful, isn't it? Now. This year we've been making a series of films that mark the Queen's Green Canopy, which is a fantastic project that celebrates our late Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Our next film is about a man who has made it his mission to save his local orchards. It started about 10 years ago and uh, I live in a small village in Gloucestershire and I was cycling around and saw all these old orchards where there was loads of fruit on the floor in the autumn and uh, I thought it'd be a great idea to make a little bit of cider and so I, I knocked on the door of the, the farmers and asked them if I could have their fruit to make some cider and to share it with my friends. 
So in exchange for the fruit, I, I go in and I restore an orchard. So I do lots of pruning and uh, graft apple trees for them and do lots of replanting in, in the hope that I will keep these orchards going um, for the future generations. My name's Tim Andrews and I live in North Nibley, Gloucestershire and I have a real passion for traditional orchards like this one. So I look after about five or six uh, orchards uh, within Gloucestershire where we've planted 360 trees, 120 different varieties. Orchards are in a terrible condition across the entire country. So we, we've lost in Gloucestershire about 75% of the orchards that we once had over the last 50 years. Lots of these old orchards are uh, owned by you know, quite old farmers and as they see the fruit being picked and these orchards being restored, it reminds them of what their dad used to do you know, back in the 1940s and 50s. This orchard is called Pockets Orchard. It's a fantastic old traditional orchard. The peri trees are over 200 years old and the apple trees are about 100 years old. Peri trees are really special to what we call the four counties. So most of the peri trees were planted in the early 1800s and there hasn't been much planting since and a lot of them are coming to the end of their lives. So without some replanting, without some succession management going on, um, in a few years' time there won't be many peri pear trees across Gloucestershire. When we came here it was full of scrub and the trees were in a, a really bad state, the apple trees were really top heavy, lots and lots of mistletoe. We started to do some pruning to help the apple trees survive and so they don't fall over and remove some of that, that mistletoe and we're starting to make a difference. We get up to 20 or so volunteers here uh, once a month on a, on a Saturday and it's a, a wide range of people. My children have always um, been with us uh, all the time as well, so right since being a little baby our kids have been part of this. Orchards tend to have a, a space in a traditional orchard of about 8 to 10 metres between each tree and that was to allow this mixed use of orchards, so it, they would be grazed in um, different parts of times of the year. Because of the spacing, you've got areas of shade, you've got areas of sunlight through, you've got amazing hedgerows and you've got some scrub. And so the biodiversity of traditional orchards far outweighs the modern intensive orchards that we have. I make about sort of six, seven thousand litres of cider every year. But you start off with uh, what's called a scratter, like a, a garden shredder turns them into a, a kind of what we call pomace and sort of mulches them all down. Then you put them into a press and then that squeezes it and uh, you get lots of juice out. The bit for me about being a teacher is you love to tell a story, you love to share what you know you love to other people and a great opportunity for me was to be able to talk to people about the things that I enjoy, the things I love about traditional orchards and share those skills. So the idea is that um, we make a little cut on, on this one and we take one of the buds off here and we're going to make that be the same size in theory. So we cut down into it. All fruit trees are, are grafted and, and grafting is when you take the rootstock, so you take the roots of one apple tree and you combine it to a variety of apple that you want on top that we call the scion. The rootstock controls the size of the tree and the scion controls what type of fruit that you get up on top. That grafting point, that kind of scar can remain for hundreds of years. And I'd say in terms of the scion, so in terms of the variety of the fruit, is be adventurous and go for something that is more interesting that you can't buy in a supermarket. Certain villages have their, their own variety of apple that's specific to them. Um, so near, near me there's a village called Cambridge and there's the Cambridge Queenin or the Cambridge Coinin um, apple that's specific to that area. <laughs> Orchards are a fantastic place just to reflect and listen and chill and just take in those surroundings. 
Orchards are in a, a real dire state across the entire county and it, you know, there's too much for a one-man band to, to make a big difference. So if I can share those skills and share that love around and more people are looking after these orchards, then we've got a better chance of making a difference. Tim, I think we are lucky to have people like you. And I love the idea of local. I've got my hands on an apple called Lord Burley, which is local to me. And I've planted it in a front garden. Meanwhile, here in the back garden, I'm growing a less familiar fruit, but one that's a bit special to me. It's actually a medlar. And it's a plant that dates back to Roman times, makes a fantastic jelly, also a cheese curd, a bit like lemon curd. But we used to have one in the garden when we were kids, and I can remember climbing it and then picking the fruits and throwing them around. But I think, though it's a tree that's dipped in and out of fashion, it's stunning. Early flower, fantastic autumn colour. And I know the fruits are not necessarily the most stunning, but for me, they evoke a memory. Now, time for another one of your films. And that idea of memory plays a big part. Hi, Gardeners World. I'm Matthew. And I'm Carolyn. And this is our garden in Liversidge, West Yorkshire. The garden belonged to my grandparents for 50 years, and they were really avid gardeners. Since we bought the house, we've tried to fill the gaps between their plants with our favourites. We want the garden to be a haven for pollinators the whole year round. We've also added a bird feeder and bath so that all the birds have plenty of food to last them the year. Back in spring, my grandparents' daffodils and muscari finish blooming just as our tulips and crown imperials come into flower. These then pass the baton to Carolyn's favourite alliums just before the summer arrives and then our fuchsias, buddleia and heleniums all spring into life. The flowers and the bird feeder have brought many kinds of wildlife to the garden that we didn't expect. We've seen many types of butterflies and bees, together with squirrels, woodpeckers and even some birds of prey. This is our backyard where back in the day the outside toilet and coal shed would have been. We're trying to make it a lovely place to sit and relax and I've added raised beds, lollipops, troughs and an arch to make the most of every space possible. Last year we grew dahlias for the first time in the backyard and we absolutely loved them. We planted the tubers out into the garden in mid-June once the last risk of frost had disappeared but that meant we didn't get any flowers until mid-August. This year we tried something different, so we've planted them up in these two movable containers. Whenever there was a chance in April and May of any frost, I lifted the containers up and put them in the garage overnight to protect them, and then brought them back out and put them in the sun the next day. And as you can see, it's had an effect and we've got quite big healthy plants already. I've dug around the edge of the individual plant to reveal the nice tubers underneath. And I'm just gonna put these in our raised beds. Hopefully, a nice display. The dahlias flowered eight weeks earlier than they did this time last year when we planted the tubers directly into the ground. Hope you've enjoyed your trip to our garden. Cheers! Cheers. Matthew. Karen, I think your grandparents would be incredibly proud of what you're doing. Now, when you move in somewhere new, you worry a little bit about the pets escaping, not the vegetables. No? <laughs> Look at this squash, it's gone absolutely balmy. The other day I was driving home from town, but what's that coming over the hedge? It was the squash coming over the hedge going up on the path, it nearly got run over. So I had to stop the car, get it and push it back over the hedge so it didn't literally get squashed. So here's something that's not quite as rampant. I remember about four or five weeks ago, I sowed this Chinese cabbage and he had it all covered and it didn't look like it was doing very well. I uncovered it. It seems that whatever it was being attacked by has now backed off. And I think probably another couple of weeks, I'll be harvesting them and making some stir fry. 
but I don't want this veg garden just to be about veggies and I want it still to look beautiful. So what I've done so far is put these two apples in. They're miniature, they're architectural, they're great for saving space, but also adding more variety. But actually I've not stopped there. I've started to tie them into shapes. Great for small space. And then I've put the herbs through. I'm gonna leave gaps for more annual vegetables. But today I wanna to get in a couple more bits. What I want to do is I want to add a layer of soft fruit as well. So strawberries, a couple of gooseberries, but today, black currant. That one's called Big Ben. Lovely, big, juicy fruits. When it comes to planting black currants, you actually bury about an inch of the stem. And what that does is that really stimulates good growth from below the ground. Roots are all good. So I've put plenty of organic matter in here with me, it's well rotted manure, so the soil's in good nick. So all we're doing then is just pulling that in, firming it in around. So once I've given that a good water in, it's got the winter now for the roots really to start to establish that plant. And next year, not only will it taste lovely, but it'll look good too. So, I've got a rule. When it comes to the herbs in this garden, you can't just work in the kitchen, you've got to look good. So today, we have silver sorrel. And this covers the ground, only grows just shy of a foot, but when you taste these leaves, really lemony, absolutely fantastic with fish. And the new foliage is beautiful because Really sort of silvery detail and wonderful sort of heart shape. If I just break this up a bit and then put that in. Really good worker for the kitchen, but it looks lovely too. Now it's time to go back to the south coast to rejoin Francis. Drought-tolerant perennials and self-seeded annuals are creating a tapestry of colour at this private garden in East Sussex. For the last two years, head gardener Chris Brown has been experimenting to see what will thrive in minimal watering in such a dry part of the country. And he's taken inspiration from his love of the coast. So this is one of the first borders that we planted up for this real sort of drought-tolerant experimental planting. You must be very pleased with how it's turned <laughs> out. <laughs> so Chris, you grew up by the sea and you know all the flora of the coastline. How has that affected your planting here? I spent a lot of my childhood on the beach down at New Haven, observing those plants there and how they survive in such an extreme habitat. It's fascinating to me, really, you know, because the coast is so harsh. Um, we sort of looked at those adaptations and how we could apply those into the garden, just helping us with things like water conservation and less watering in the garden to create, hopefully, future-proof planting. And I see that there are species here that would be found on the coast, like the teasels, the fennel. Um, are there any other coastal things, or are you taking that idea of adaptations and defence against drought and just using than a whole range of different plants. Yeah, exactly. So we've brought in plants like sea kale, yellow horned poppy, uh, sea thrift. The teasel, for example, it's actually a beautiful garden plant and often considered as a weed in the wild, but we grow this actively and we encourage it as well as a self sower because birds will eat those seeds and then in turn that feeds into the rest of the ecosystem. So. We've chosen these plants here obviously for their drought tolerance, but we like to include a couple of other benefits as well. Aesthetics, of course, we're in a garden, it needs to be beautiful, and also wildlife benefit too. So if we can sort of combine all three of those things and still create something beautiful, then I think we're heading in the right direction. 
How intensive is the maintenance of this? When the plants are first planted, there will be spot watering for the first year, but only directly targeted to plants that are wilting, that look yeah. like they actively need it. Um, generally, you'll grow a sort of slightly shorter plant, but it will be stronger, and then it will be able to withstand drought better in the future as well. So yeah. It's, yeah. if you continuously water everything, then it becomes reliant on that water. Yeah. So you need to try and reduce that as much as possible, yeah. And if you build root resilience, then even if the top of a plant does die back in extreme drought like we're having, the roots are strong and dormant, but holding on to their goodness for next year when they can hopefully regrow again. Absolutely. In... By treating these plants tough, growing them mean, it gives them that resilience that you need in a garden. For, for less watering and that kind of thing. Have you seen a big change here over the years? We're noticing some plants that have been here for a long time are suffering. As that happens, we're taking those plants out and replacing them with plants that we know are going to work. That also makes our lives as gardeners easier because we don't have to water things so much. We're not trying to fight nature, we're trying to work with it. The verbascum I saw on the beach is very much at home here. But Chris has discovered other plants from dry climates all over the world to experiment with. Things like verbenas, Mediterranean plant, uh, loves the drought and it's a brilliant self-sower within this space as well, so it helps us get that naturalistic feel. It says Verbena bonariensis. This is uh, a lovely cultivar, Verbena hostata rosea. That's lovely. And then we've got it? other things mm. like the agastache blackadder, the liatris. The lovely seed heads of the hordium They're as well. They're beautiful, aren't yes. they? And they obviously have suffered with a bit of drought, but they look all the better for it yeah. amongst everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, there are plenty of familiar garden plants that can survive in extreme circumstances. Achillea has a vast root system which allows it to seek out any moisture lingering in the soil and its narrow divided leaves help reduce water loss. Long flowering euphorbia are drought tolerant and heat tolerant. Their roots lying just beneath the soil surface means they can take advantage of even brief showers or morning and evening dews. The tall spikes of purple porovskia add height and colour. This Russian sage can tolerate desert conditions and it's perfect for poorer soils. Do you think that planting with an awareness of climate change would work in every garden? Absolutely. I mean, with the way the climate's going, we're all going to have to do that. It's an ever-changing dynamic process of finding the right plants that will survive. Every single garden has microclimates within them. But yeah, it's definitely finding the right plants for the right place, but that doesn't have to be done first time round, you know. <laughs> no gardener's perfect and we all make mistakes, so it's nice to actually have that changeability and adaptability within the space. With record temperatures and hosepipe bans becoming more common, creating any new garden may feel like a daunting challenge. But experimenting like Chris has and using inspiration from drought-proof coastal plants means we don't have to compromise on colour and beauty in our gardens. So, I want to add some bulbs to my garden. That's a definite. I've ordered quite a few, so I've got some allium, some species tulips, but I haven't got a clue where I'm going to put them. So what I'm going to do is containerize them, put them in little pots, and then plant them next year in the green. Another way that this works really well, imagine you've got bulbs in the garden, you're not quite sure where they are, but you want to add more bulbs. Well, if you do this, Next year, when your bulbs are coming out of the ground, you can then slip these in around them and you're not going to start digging up the bulbs that are already there. Actually, you could do this with any spring bulb. So the allium that I've got here 
is called Purple Rain. It has got a fantastic head on it that gets to about 15 centimetres, but rich, deep colour. Ash, Ash, Ash the cat is there, messing about, trying to get your attention. Are you finished? Yeah, right. So what I've got is a pot that's about 15 centimetres deep, and then I'm putting about 20 to 30 mil peat-free multi-purpose compost in the bottom. So when I'm popping them in, what I'm doing is looking for that little rooted bit on the bottom, making sure that goes down, and then just filling it up. And it really is that simple. So once I've potted all these up, I'll give them a soaking, tuck them away somewhere, you know, making sure they're in a little sheltered spot. They'll grow on, and then they'll go in the garden next year. So I know what I'll be doing at the weekend, but here's a few things for you, if you fancy it. Autumn onion sets are available to buy now and should go into the ground before the end of November. I'm using a variety called Radar, which has performed well for me before. Gently push the sets into the soil, allowing 10 to 15 centimetres between each one. Keep well weeded and by June, they'll be ready to harvest. If you don't have anywhere to store your dahlias or other tender plants over the winter, you could always dry, leaving them in the ground. In cold, wetter areas, they may not survive, but in dry parts of the country, an extra layer of insulation will certainly help. I'm using a thick mulch of composted bark, but straw, garden compost or well-rotted manure would work just as well. And your poppies are best sown where you want them to grow. And autumn is a good time to do this. Rake over the soil after removing any weeds and then lightly scatter the seed. Poppy seeds need light to germinate, so there's no need to cover it. I love the light this time of year and the garden seems to slow and the atmosphere changes. I know you're not even looking at me, are you? Yes, she's okay for those that are asking. It's been all about ash, hasn't it? Isla's quite happy and quite settled. Right, baby? Well, I'm afraid that is it from us this week. I do hope you've enjoyed it. But Monty will be back next week at Longmeadow at 8 p.m. In the meantime, look after yourselves. Bye-bye. Can you say bye-bye?